Welcome back to Radio Juxtapose. Today, Evan and myself are in conversation with the American animator and painter, Matt Bollinger. And we're back in it today with a new interview here at Radio Juxtapose, the podcast that rummages around the nooks and crannies of the contemporary art world with those that shape it. My name is Doug Gillen, and I'm really excited to be welcoming Matt Bollinger on the show today. Matt Bollinger is a contemporary American painter and animator known for his deeply narrative, emotive works that blur the boundaries between painting, animation, and storytelling. His fictionalized rural small town of Holmes, Missouri serves as the backdrop for much of his work, reflecting both on his own experiences and the everyday lives of working class middle America. Through his often deadpan expressions, like deer caught in the headlights, his characters invite us to explore themes of isolation, nostalgia, and the often overlooked aspects of life. Matt's technique stands out for its meticulous layering of acrylic paint, his cinematic and often abstract use of light within his compositions, as well as the integration of stop-motion animation where he transforms his paintings into haunting, lifelike moving tableau. Matt's work can be seen as part of a broader tradition of American painters who have examined the complexities of rural and suburban life. Loosely falling within the lineage of the Ashcan school, comparisons to figures like John Sloan, Andrew Wyeth or Edward Hopper are often drawn. Loneliness in urban landscapes and often haunting quiet fills the intimate scenes of American rural life. Matt's use of animation brings these environments to life, blending cinematic techniques with painting, situating firmly within the 21st century, offering a new dimension to the storytelling tradition within American art. I first met Matt at his show Half Time at Mother's Tank Station in London during the first quarter of 2024, and at the time of recording he had just come off the back of curating a group show for the Fine Artworks Centre at this year's Armoury in New York. We are really excited to have him on the podcast today. As always, let us know where you're listening in from. Hit us up on social media. All the relevant links will be in the show notes for the episode. Let's get into it right now as Evan Preco and myself welcome Matt Bollinger to Radio Juxtapose. So, hey, Matt, first off, so nice to see you. There's so much, obviously, there's so much to talk about uh, in terms of your work and the content of your work, but um, you're a, you're a, you have a bit, you've been a man of curation. I have, yeah. And you just curated a show, Edge Condition? Yeah, yeah, at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, it was, it was great. They, I'm, it's ongoing, and uh, the show is going to travel to the Armory Show in New York in September. But it's a benefit exhibition to one of the best artist residencies in the world. And I, I lived there for years. I was just, I just, they couldn't get rid of me. I, I this place was amazing. And, you know, it's like a, a moment where everybody's struggling for affordable studios and housing and things like that all over. And here's this residency that pays you a monthly stipend, gives you an apartment, gives you a studio, and you're in a community with 20 uh, it's 10 visual artists and 10 writers, uh, kind of at the the end of the world. Uh, Cape Cod, it, you know, extends out into the ocean and you're just there all winter. And it's it's an amazing, amazing place that is surprisingly not as well known as some artist residencies. Uh, but it's exactly what people need. This is just an extension of that relationship. Yeah, they. Uh, so the, the Benefit Exhibition is, uh, they, they've started it a few years ago. Uh, Angela Dufresne, who's an amazing painter, curated the first iteration of this. Heidi Hahn curated the last one. She's great. What well, we're all, she is great. Um, she gave up, uh, donated a piece for this exhibition. And we're all former fellows. We've all, we all did the residency and uh, they've been, the, the people at the work center have been reaching out to, to former fellows to organize shows of former fellows. So it's, you, you know, just drawing upon the, decades and decades of amazing artists working um, to to put the show together. How common is it that a residency like that will have such a huge impact on the rest of your kind of outlook? Because I, I, I talk to a lot of artists that have done residencies and things like that. It's not really something I've actually really probed into. You just kind of just see it as like, okay, we, they had a little block, but obviously here you are now kind of still engaging with it and obviously 
speaking, you know, glowingly about that experience. How common is that? I can speak to my own experience. I, I went to the work center after graduate school, not really ready to to have try to find full time employment. I still was figuring out so much about my work that uh, I needed a place that was kind of uh, a safe place to make mistakes. And uh, I completely changed the type of work I made. I, I did have a, I had a show right out of graduate school and then the gallery closed and it was kind of the, the, and then I got this residency. So it was kind of the best thing that could happen that I had no obligations, but I had support and I, I just overhauled the way that I made things. So it had a huge lasting impact. And because it's such a long, it's a seven month residency. That's a long safe space. That's a long time. Yeah. It's like a, it's like an academic year. You know, you come in the fall and you in, you leave in the spring. In Provincetown during the summer, I don't know if you've ever been, but it's an amazing resort town and it goes, it, you know, the population explodes. It goes, it's wild. But in the winter, there's just the locals. Most of the restaurants are closed. There's one bar open, one or two. Drag karaoke persists through the winter, uh, which saves a lot of people. Shout out to Dana Danzel, uh, <laughs> DJ, uh, MC of uh, drag karaoke, but uh, still doing it. It I was there in, I don't know, 2008 or nine. Did you have a character? Well, you didn't have to be in drag. It was sort of drag host. Okay. Nobody has to, Matt, but did you? That's a different question. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. I did have a collection of wigs. You know, they did make an appearance now and then. You didn't have a lot to do. You know, you're in your studio and, and all that. But, you know, I used to have the, the, the long germination period, having seven months with no real obligations um, and just uh, just loads and loads of time, sometimes almost too much time, <laughs> traumatic amounts of time with yourself. Uh, but it but it was amazing because you can uh, you can make these huge kinds of changes. I mean, the other thing is that you're instantly uh, put into a community of uh, really, really talented people. It's interdisciplinary. So there'll be filmmakers, installation artists, um, and then five poets, five fiction writers. And every week there's a there's a reading. There are guest artists coming throughout the winter and they do studio visits. So you're just you're getting all this community um, and all this time at the at the same moment. So it's just it couldn't be more supportive. Mm. Um, so, you know, big, uh, big shout out to them. I think people uh, should way more people should apply. It should be on like everybody's. You know, February rolls around, you're sending off that application trying to get in there. It seems like uh, that would really, really work well for the, what, the work that you make because of all the different interdisciplinary ways that your work goes. But what was your work before you went to the residency? Like you said like it kind of changes. You were there. Like what, <laughs> like what, was, what, was, Matt, what was Matt Bollinger out of grad school going into? What, what, what was the work looking like? Uh, yeah, well, okay. So the, I'll just describe the process because it kind of shaped how it looked. I would start a group of paintings by writing a, like a film script. And then I would make sets and costumes. I'd sew costumes. So, you know, easy, easy access drag karaoke there. That's why I had the wigs. Um, <laughs> and my studio sure, would become Matt. a kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Quick, think of something. I made sets. I made sets. <laughs> so the studio would look like kind of like a soundstage for, uh, you know, for a little while. And I would cast friends as characters uh, in what I had written. And they would come in usually in the evening there'd usually be a certain amount of you know the beer and wine would flow uh we would we would uh record a video of this performance and i would take that into the pure i crop stills i would edit it into a finished thing that would go into the you know the deep dark youtube <laughs> i think some of them are still floating around in there then i would crop stills from that video i would fiddle with the color in photoshop and do you know wild things with that i would I would then choose some of my favorites and I would make drawings to find a composition. And at the end of all of that, I'd make a painting, an oil painting that would take about a week, start to finish. And the the process started to, to feel a, a little bit indirect. So I, uh, I just, I kind of threw it all out. I stopped because they looked, you could tell that there were figures of reference from photographs. They were very social looking, art school looking kind of environments of, uh, you know, people getting together in these constructed. I don't know if you've spent uh, any time in Providence around RISD, but that's where I went to grad school. So there was a kind of energy that 
was was very exciting as a student to kind of tap into. But it it was a little alien to me being from Missouri. Uh, I always felt like a a bit of a an, an outlier tourist or something. After I had that show and got the residency, I just stopped. I stopped oil painting. I stopped using photographs, and I just uh, I just sat down. There was a drafting table in a storage closet, so I dragged it out and I got a big piece of paper and I just started drawing with pencil. And I did that for about eighteen months. Um, and I didn't, I didn't paint at all. And it, it was actually a long journey for me to get back to, to painting on canvas, kind of the more what we think of as painting. But, you know, as, as a undergraduate student, I had studied creative writing. There was a moment in that writing process. I, I wrote very bad poetry. Um, uh, but the, but I enjoyed the process of looking at the blank page and having to sort of conjure words and images out of, out of my mind's eye and drawing was like that. Painting it was hard to, to do that. I, I I could do it now, but at the time I didn't know how to. So just going back to this most basic, what I thought of as a very basic medium, was where I started as a kid. It was like sharpening the number two pencil down to a nub and like just drawing, drawing, drawing. So yeah, it felt it reflected that. But I needed that time um, to to find my way to that. How does that? compare then to what the process would be like for a painting now there's still staging and lighting and set design because i feel like there's still elements in there that come from that learning i think i did learn a lot from having painted from photographs for probably almost a decade uh, of pretty constant practice and painting from drawing from life too so you kind of build up a visual repertoire of a visual memory um, how light falls on on a face or something like that. Um, but the process is really, there isn't a staged, there isn't something outside of the painting or outside of the drawings that I'm looking at and then copying onto the surface of the canvas. For me, I want the, the, the kind of center of that event to exist on the canvas itself. I want to be discovering things and constructing them there and paint. Um, but it took a long time to be able to get to that. So just in practical terms, I'll have an idea for uh, painting, uh, like the locker room that was in the the show that I, I just had in London. And the uh, I'll think, oh, okay, I want to have this, this locker room setting is kind of like a stage set. So I like, I like the shallow space of it, the wall of lockers. And I always had pictured the, the hallway moving down to uh, the door that exits onto the football field. I had I had a few elements that I wanted to construct with, and I ma- started making tiny drawings in my sketchbook. That I spend kind of a lot of time on to work out compositions, uh, to try to discover some of the characters through drawing. So drawing for me is a kind of uh, it's basically a literary process. It's how I write the narrative. It's not a story that's written elsewhere. It's watching the image develop under the under the end of the pencil and kind of reacting to it. So there isn't a narrative written down before, like uh, in contrast to how it was before. Right. There might be, a, you know, in something that's more elaborate, like one of my animations, there'll be a kind of outline or treatment of, a, of a, you know, just a li- almost a bullet point list of a sequence of events. Um, but when I go to the drawing, that's when I develop the characterization, try to try to tap into some of the who that person is and why they're doing what they're doing. I've read, you know, I've read film scripts and and there's there's so much in them and I'm kind of not capable of writing that way. But drawing is sort of my it's my special thing. I don't know, it's my superpower. I can see that happening. It comes to life when I through drawing. So yeah, it's it's at that moment of, you know, I maybe made 15 little bitty drawings in my sketchbook of different moments and the overall composition for that, that, uh, painting. Um, and I did something a little different because the painting is so big. It was an eight foot, uh, it is an eight foot painting. I photographed all those drawings and then I brought them into the computer and I just put some of them together. I had the little bitty thumbnail, but there wasn't a lot of detail. And then I had all these detailed moments of the character's face or like how the knee is being wrapped. He's been injured and he's, he's getting his knee wrapped before going back out in the second half. And so I was able to like plop those on to the thumbnail and then paint over it with a little bit of color. I was like, is it going to be a yellow painting or is it going to be this kind of blue gray painting? And it ended up actually being both of those. I ended up putting those two palettes together, but then I leap into this huge canvas with this. I have these, these resources. I understand the characters to some degree. I know the composition 
And then I make a giant messy abstract thing uh, that tries to just tap into the the color atmospheres and the energies of the of the painting of the same painting the same painting yeah to to get it actually onto that canvas so I'm mixing up big amounts of color and I'm throwing it onto the surface and uh, I have these I have like a one foot wide wallpaper brush that I'll you know use to kind of block things in and I have a two foot wide concrete texturing brush from the hardware store that I'll drag across the surface to move the paint. I mean, really large uh, tools. And it just gets, it It makes it so that in an hour of, of doing that, I've got the whole surface activated and talking back to me, you know, that sense of, you know, seeing it develop under your hands. I want, I want it to be talking back to me. I'm not someone who would draw out the picture and then fill it in. That just that to, for me that I mean, that works great for some people and they don't want to have the chaos underneath their their images that mine has. I want it talking back to me and I want to be surprised all the time. You know, it's a little bit like when you if you go on a road trip, you kind of know where you want to go, but it's it's exciting to just turn left and follow some side path and uh, you know really meander on your way there, and rather than just go go in the most efficient way. Um, and kind of you kind of miss out on all these these moments that uh, wouldn't be there if you hadn't been kind of leaping off the uh, the cliff. I'm mixing my metaphors. I'm leaping off the cliff in the car, Thelma and Louise right. style. Yeah, there you go. Um, you seem to, um, I would say that you want to get the mood right. And it, it, it really works with the, the final result of your paintings and also with the animations of the shorts. Uh, so like the co color and mood is sort of where Matt begins. Well, I never make things too easy for myself, but um, co color and mood in direct conversation with whatever that subject is. So I'm, I might be thinking of two guys in the backyard uh, tinkering on some junked cars um, so I kind of, that, that's the amount of writing that would be there. That, that painting is in my studio right now. Wait, wait. So literally it would be like two guys in, in backyard fixing old car. Yeah. That, I might, if I don't have time to draw it at, at the initial, like when I initially had the idea, I'll just be like, guys, guys working on car. Um, I, th that one, I also had the idea that they would be almost overlapping. They'd be like right in the center of the composition kind of tied up together in a way like linked visually because of the. The compression of the space and then figuring out how to embody that in some fashion because painting for me is a kind of it's such a physical thing that the the embodiment of the narrative the the kind of viscerality of the of the narrative is so important so it is it is finding the, the mood and the color and and having it get into some kind of sympathy with that subject maybe even contrast to that subject um that achieves that you know, that tangled up kind of embodiment. How embroiled into these characters and this story do you become when you're painting them? Because it sounds like it's quite, you know, almost like an overwhelming experience. It, it can be a little obsessing for sure. It, it depends on how, how well the painting is going. But, uh, you know, in the narrative, there's the struggle to make the painting and then there's the narrative. And they're not always, uh, you know, the, achieving that narrative and and succeeding, pulling off the painting it, to some degree. Those are not necessarily the same things. Does one inform the other? I think they do. Um, some sometimes when I'm struggling with the painting, so that I don't come home and and uh, so I'm not an asshole when I come home. <laughs> you were trying to think of a diplomatic way of saying that. Yeah, You're no. like, nope. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it didn't succeed. Um, but I'll I'll come home and I you know it, it 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 can just weigh on your mind. You know when you when something is failing, so I'll come home and I'll just draw, uh, and I won't look. I'll I'll resist the urge to photograph the painting at the end of the day because I'll just stare at it. I'll just try to like fix it with laser beams shooting out of my eyes. <laughs> Instead, I'll come home and I'll just you know when I have a moment. Uh, my our evening routine, you know, we have dinner. I have a six year old, so I, you know, I help her through bath brushing teeth, hand her off for story time. My my wife reads her stories, and I get to come down and I have like a small block of time um, before the next, you know, 
uh, she comes down and has to be carried back upstairs. There's this thing we always do. Ah, uh, the dance. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it works. We've got it. It's always like a spinning plates. Uh, so I'll sit down and draw. And if I've been, if I'm really hung up on a painting, I might draw just a piece of it or a character's face or some moment of light or a gesture. And that, that ends up being really freeing because it's it's not that that exact compressed flat surface that was giving me such a hard time. It's about who that person is and finding something different about them. Um, so for, for me, uh, that ends up being the way that the, you know, the struggle, the formal struggle with achieving the painting ends up developing the character more mm -hmm. because I see them from a slightly, right. you know, different point of view. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like the way of uh, a sculptor must have to think, you know, you can't just think of it from a single vantage point. You've got to be able to ro turn it around in your head a little bit um, as you try to visualize what you're going to do. And it's also how, how an animator has to think uh, because you're you might be drawing something and then they turn and you and so you have to know more about them than you're seeing at any one moment. So that usually helps me come back. It, it, it builds a little confidence too. like I succeeded at this tiny drawing, but it, it's amazing how that dopamine release <laughs> makes you feel like uh, so much more capable uh, when you go in the next day. So yeah, the two things, the two things are related. I, I would say just a, a little more about it is that sometimes I just keep, uh, I don't necessarily know the character when I'm painting them. And then through painting them, I learn a little bit more about them. And it might start with like, oh, I know this is, I want I want the guy that's with the car and I'm, and I might paint him again later. And then I know a, he evolves just a little bit. And then I might paint him in a different situation a third time. And then, so he kind of develops over a period of, of images where I'm learning about him. He's telling me what he, uh, what, what type of a character he is, uh, rather than it being kind of preconceived and, uh, and then performed on the surface. So it's kind of, it's back to that, that sense of like, it has to happen there right before me in the way that, you know, a lot of creative processes can be really generous to you. Like they can give back characters and surprises that, you know, that generate the next thing. I had this question I was going to ask later on, but now you mentioned these kind of characters going across different uh, paintings uh, and drawings. Like, how many cast of characters do you think you have at the moment that you're painting and that you're kind of interacting with? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I um, there are some there are kind of favorites that I return to again and again. Who's your favorite? Yeah, I was going to say, who's your favorite child at this point? There, there's a woman named Candy uh, who's in one of my animations, uh, the second of these black and white. Uh, they're all called Holmes, Missouri. It was a, it's a sort of fictional central Missouri Ozark town that I. Uh, I kind of it kind of lives in my mind so the characters can keep recur recurring it's like you drive to the the grocery store and you you're likely to see one of the characters who lives in Holmes. so they keep popping back up and and in the animation that i did she's older in her life and is kind of housebound she's uh uh on an oxygen tank and her son uh kyle who's uh kind of a total stoner who uh, mows lawns. He's mowing her lawn and she's inside watching Lethal Weapon 2 on TV. But she's based a little bit on my grandmother, um, who I, I really loved so much and who lived in, in on the Lake of the Ozarks. So I would go there as a kid. And in the at, at the end of her life, she was on oxygen. So it's kind of where some of those details came from. But I, I, I keep drawing her. There's this, like the shape of her face and she's often wearing the... Uh, this T-shirt my mom always had in the in the '90s. It was like a Tasmanian Devil cartoon, both like triple XL kind of a thing. Um, Way you're just swimming in it. So so Candy is wearing that, and she popped up recently, six months ago maybe. And suddenly I'm writing a new film project about her, um, but she's younger, and it's about her working life and her sort of fantasy life, and uh, you know where. Uh, where her imagination goes. She's a house cleaner in the Ozarks, cleaning all these vacation homes. Are you from Holmes, Missouri? I know it's, it's a fictional place, but are you from a place that is... Sim uh, does that come from a place of uh, nonfiction? In part. I, so I, uh, I'm i from Gladstone, Missouri. Uh, <laughs> I, I would, a tiny, the little suburb of Kansas City. 
and my grandmother lived in in the Ozarks. So I kind of I was at the time that I started writing that town, I was living in upstate uh, in the Hudson Valley, uh, New York, and in a town called Holmes. So I I combined where I was then, which was you know I'd moved from Brooklyn to Holmes. So it was uh, the first time I'd really lived in a in a more rural setting, um, you know, since visiting my grandma as a kid. And so I combined that with the the places that I remember on the Lake of the Ozarks with where I was living, and I kind of made that a new composite. So you know, there were a few different access points for me to kind of relate to it. Is Holmes then now technically like your your universe? This is where all your work now exists within this world. Um, I think a lot of it. I think that it's 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 a little like me moving between Kansas City and the Ozarks. So I've just finished a, a video installation project uh, that takes place in Kansas City, but most of most of the things that I'm doing are set in Holmes. I want to give myself some flexibility or some latitude to to go where the story wants to go. The character in that in this new video project, uh, Dawn. She has just graduated from the Art Institute in Kansas City, which is where I went to undergrad, and uh, is sort of struggling in a post uh, postgraduate life. She's homeless. She lives in her car, um, but she doesn't want anyone to know. So she works at a CVS, and uh, the the video is just a loop of one of a variation on a day in her life. So there's uh, in in real time in the gallery, the every loop will be different. But it doesn't present as, oh, you're going to see 14 different variations on her day because it's a randomized loop. Um, so you might you might see the same day a few times or you might see really divergent days. Uh, but every day she goes to work, every day she has to deal with something about her car. Some days she locks herself out, for instance. Sounds like she needs to go to a residency. She does. Yeah, so if only she of, knew. If only she could listen to this podcast, that would help her out. <laughs> would you be able to to paint, to create this like social realistic Ashcan kind of new generation if you stayed in Missouri? Or did you have to leave in order to get this these stories out of yourself? I think that's a really good question. Um, I th- yeah, I think I did need to leave because being... When I was growing up, I was always ready to leave and I wanted to live in a big city and I wanted to be where art seemed to be happening. And I also just didn't, I had my own kind of biases against, you know, my people basically. I tried to, you know, I actively worked to lose my Missouri accent because I thought people would, would, I don't know, judge me or something like that. Um, but as I, as I left, I realized, oh, there was, so, that, that was something and it really does matter to me more and more. It's shaped not just what I paint, but the fact that my paintings are recognizable and accessible. I remember having conversations in school where people we were in undergrad. So a lot of people were from Kansas City or from the Midwest. Um, or I had friends from Kentucky and, and Illinois, and they would we would say, like, we're making work that our that like our our parents can't understand. And there was a there was a kind of a, there was like both a joy and anxiety there. It was like you know the childhood rebellion or something, but also like wait, are we are we becoming so are we becoming too elite or something? So I but I but I have realized that over time my work has become more maybe more accessible to <laughs> to my mom. Um, who knows? Uh, but <laughs> what do the real versions of the people in your paintings? Feel or how do they respond or react to these to these works? I um, I have been kind of pleasantly, you know, I haven't shown them in Kansas City. I I had a few pieces that were kind of earlier works shown. Oh, I don't know, uh, eight years ago. So the work has changed a bit. Um, but where I get the most responses, uh, you know, I post things on Instagram, and someone will say, "Oh, I'm from." uh iowa or i'm i'm actually from i'm like living in the ozarks i put like hashtag ozarks on one of them <laughs> and uh, this guy popped on he's like i live there and i'm making art this is you know so meaningful to me so people i mostly just have really positive responses from people yeah someone from iowa came to see work i showed in in 
Miami and he was he was really like this you know there's like a high V grocery store behind one of the characters he's like this is just what it looks like it's just they they were feeling mm. kind of seen in a in a really a uh, really great way I, I I also take kind of take pains to try to avoid reductiveness on either through caricature or through like I I, I want to uh, create characters where you don't necessarily know um, how I feel about them. And I think that it lets people see, I don't know, see into them without feeling judged or... Like, because this is such a tightrope and it's something I was I was wanting to ask you about this kind of like navigating that terrain of portrayal of working class Midwestern America. And especially, you know, you used that word elite earlier as well. If you're coming out and now you're looking in rather than representing from within, you're looking towards it. What are some of the tropes that you have to avoid or what are some of the, yeah, how do you navigate that terrain of avoiding tropes or character caricatures, turning your characters into caricatures when you're depicting people? Sorry, it's a convoluted way, but you, I, I think you, you might get this sense. No, no, I think that I think that's a really good, it's a really good question. Um, and I think it's, uh, maybe I have a simple, maybe my answer is a little simple, but um, for me, the the antithesis of caricature is specificity. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I could speak for the Midwest is huge. I don't think I could really speak to the, to the breadth of experience. And I would feel, it makes me feel very anxious to feel like that would be what I was uh, trying to do. I don't, I don't have that confidence. So I try to be specific to either things that I've, I've, directly experienced or I, I've interviewed family members. I record interviews, uh, with them to get specifics. I read like, uh, when I was preparing the character who, uh, works at CVS, I read all these, uh, reddits with, uh, these people's responses to like answering the question, what's it like to work at CVS? Cause people are thinking of like, do I apply or anything? <laughs> and it was, it was really fascinating. And so I think I, I try to not even be on the level of tropes. I try to be, you know, and something pops up and you're like, oh, that's really familiar to me. Or like, I would see that on TV. Um, then there's just, it's just a reason to, to, to pivot and not do it. The other thing is that I, I live even further upstate now. Um, and so I'm kind of like, uh, I'm four and four plus hours away from North of New York city. Um, so I live in a much more rural environment. Um, and actually it's, it's quite interesting because the, the, place that I'm thinking about is a, a, a kind of a seasonal resort in the Ozarks where people, people come in the summers and they party on boats and go fishing and do, you know, all kinds of good stuff. Um, but you know, they're year round residents and here I am up in the finger lakes, uh, of New York and people come in the summer and they camp and they go out on the water and do all, you know, a lot of the same things. So there's a, a number of things that, that are very similar. Uh, it's also a, you know, there's a thriving kind of farm community up here that is, um, that I'm much more directly, like we, we do CSAs and, and, and things like that. And you get to go out to the farm and get the, you know, pick up your, your beef from the cattle farmer. And so I, I, it, there's something, I think the other thing that this maybe goes back to Evan's question, but earlier question is I would, I would have a very hard time making this work in, if I were living in New York, in Brooklyn, because I, I, I'm responding so much to what I'm seeing all the time a detail that might appear on a pickup truck. It's because I just saw it. it. That truck just drove by. I am looking back to some degree, but I'm also in the present tense here. Just mentioned that if you were in, and I think you were in Brooklyn before, does that just not feel like your story to tell? I, I think, you know, I, I loved living in Brooklyn. It was uh, because I, there were so many artists and there was so much going on all the time, but I was trying to, I was, I'm, I respond so much to what I'm seeing that um i was making paintings and it did i felt a little alienated from the characters that i was painting and it was a little like the stuff i was doing after graduate school it was like yeah these kids are just too cool <laughs> that's not me In a country of 300 plus million people, you can't control the politics so much. Um, so you can't control how the viewer port, how the viewer takes in the characters or the subject matter you're talking about. But have you noticed a shift in the way a viewer looks at your work 
in the current climate of um, nationalistic sort of uh, movement going on in America. I don't want to. And is that kind of been an interesting conversation with you where you almost feel um, you need to protect these people from the viewer? I, I don't know if I feel that they need to be protected um, from the viewer. I think that that's just not my job. But I do remember, you know, I had a show around the time that Trump was elected and suddenly everyone uh, was, they were like, oh, I get it now. And it was, it was as though they didn't have, and, and they were like, oh, he's, someone, someone said, uh, it's radical empathy to show, you know, these people. And I was like, that doesn't seem radical, but it was, it was a lens that gave a lot of people access to the work or a way to view the work or see connections in the work because at the time i'd been doing mostly stuff that uh the show that that i had had to do with my family directly uh i interviewed my father about uh, an auto parts store that he had started a retail store um in independence missouri and it failed he he hadn't gone to business school he just was really passionate about uh car culture and he liked being around people who were uh into cars so I, I think he as much saw it as a, it was like a social place for him but it wasn't a very, it wasn't a successful business so i recorded him about that and uh there was a sculpture that played the audio in the show and there were paintings of uh, him and my mother as you know at, 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 from that uh in the 1970s and their home and uh people suddenly were like, oh, I see. It's like the Trump demographic. And I was like, well, I was just telling a very specific story, but I can see how you can extrapolate from that. But that's just where it doesn't, that's not my responsibility, I don't think. Um, I think if I think specificity is really wonderful because it becomes this germ that, that uh, grows in a lot of different ways. It becomes highly suggestive to people. Um, it's, a, it's a catalyst. So you can come and see it. And, and um, you know, the guy from Iowa who saw my stuff last year would, would see it and maybe say like, oh, my dad also was really into cars or my dad also had a business that failed. Um, that kind of working class struggle might be where he accesses it. But a lot of people living in New York were like, oh, this is how this is empathy for a Trump demographic. So it's maybe a further valence out and <laughs> quite a bit further. But, you know, I, I, I think that's OK. When you show in places like Ireland or London, or Europe or anywhere else that is not America, does that lens change? The people's comments about it change. I think it must change. I mean, I'm not, I'm not there when the, uh, you know, I might be open the show and then I go home. So I get, I kind of get those things through social media a little bit and I don't necessarily know where people are, are coming from. Um, but you know, I think, I think people respond to, uh, in Europe, there's a, there's definitely an interest in like, what is, what is this American thing that's <laughs> happening all the time? Um, but, uh, and you know, there's, and there's working class people everywhere. So I think there, there are those, uh, kind of access points, but I think a lot of people respond to things like, there's a humanism in the work that I that I strive for, and so seeing someone look back at you uh, with a with a and you know, it seems like there's something behind their eyes, you know, that kind of feeling of trying to connect to the painting on a human level is often. I think that's more more than politics uh, or even uh, some kind of regionalism. I think that's where a lot of people respond. That was definitely one of the things that I felt from halftime. Because it was the first time I'd been in a collection of your work. I'd seen paintings before, but being in, in amongst the series of them, I felt instantly watched. You walk in and <laughs> you're like, have I done something wrong? Why the fuck is everyone watching me? Because every <laughs> single eye on every single canvas, just about, I think actually every single one in halftime, you know, they're all staring at you. The, the, the subjects are, even if there's multiple subjects in a painting they're rarely engaging with each other they're looking at you or they're looking away or they're you know they're not looking at each other there's like that void that vacancy somewhere and that had such a really really arresting feeling seeing that collection what is the sort of the motivation for you as an artist to do this or is that something that you kind of you would intend to keep closer to your chest to not kind of like you know to, to lay too much out do you have do you have a specific reason for choosing that really direct gaze? Is my question. I I think that um, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm always happy to talk about. I I will demystify anything as much as I can. Um, but there there are mysteries because of the way that I work. There are mysteries to myself 
um, which I which I would I call which in a way I, it's nice to cultivate because uh, otherwise you're just in the room with I'm just in the room with me all the time and I'm self deprecating enough to not want that uh, mo- mo- pretty much all, mostly. In, in that in the process of developing a painting and wanting it to talk back to you and wanting to see something that that catalyzes me first like I'm the first member of the audience um the when they started looking back at me it started it started to have an effect like I could just I would feel something and then doing more and more of them it it pivoted the kind of the ontology of the paintings like they exist differently because they're aware of me uh, in a way, it t- comes back to the uh, the Carrie James Marshall painting that I was talking to you about uh, a few months ago. The the painting of the the two children sitting in their their camping in their backyard, and above them it says "Here I am," and they're they're looking at you, and their gaze is so that you know they're present uh, because of the the nature of their gaze. And it's I found it so I'm getting like teared up right now just thinking about it. It was so affecting to to feel that that kind of humanness uh from this inanimate thing sorry um yeah yeah yeah. it came out you curveball there but the the power of that painting right and it really yeah it's so he's he's so the work is so moving um and so trying to have have the works uh resonate to have something uh that is kind of behind that surface seem to to kind of radiate out and maybe it's a difference between the way the paintings live in the world and the way the animations live because i think the animations they don't talk to you that same way they absorb i i find them more absorbing i uh i i like to fall into a story and get lost kind of lose track of my body in a way um which is always what you know that's what drew me to art to begin with was reading comic books and just hours melting away with drawings and and story i i have to say like you getting you just having that emotional experience with the carrie james marshall painting which i mean he's the master of masters isn't that like a good reminder for you too that like how important this whole thing is like just the fact that you can still be emotional about a painting that you that you that exists like isn't that kind of all part of why this is so important it yeah absolutely it's i mean it's why i go in there every single day and and struggle because it's just such a struggle um you know to the young the young painters out there like they mostly fail until they don't (laughs) um but yeah it's so meaningful to me that we can that an individual can do this individual thing and then it speaks to another individual it's uh it, that's what it what it's all about to me. Yeah, you were talking about comic books and that being an early influence, and obviously there was this painting that was such a huge moment for you. But do you remember when you decided that this was going to be the avenue for you? I guess obviously there's been so many different mediums that you've kind of dabbled in, but uh, that you knew that this was largely the direction that you wanted to go. It was it was tough because I felt like doing something creative was kind of all I could do. Like I was, I was just not, not adjusted to that typical job. So I, in high school, I, I got, uh, I was, I was very lucky. Uh, there was a teacher who really I connected with his name was, uh, his name is David Poindexter. You know, he exposed me to, to Francis Bacon and, uh, Philip Gustin and, you know, kind of canonical expressionistic sort of figures. And he also brought in his own drawings, which I thought was really generous. I was like, oh, this guy's actually doing this thing. And so that helped a lot. I was, uh, but I was also an orchestra nerd. So I, I played cello, um, still, I still play cello. And I, w- I had my, my uh, best friend at the time, well, still a, a dear friend, Dan Majors, who's a novelist and poet. I was always trying to write as as well as as Dan could, um, and he's just he was he was the person who you spend time with, and you're like, I just I know I'm not as I'm not as smart as Dan. Like <laughs> I'm just doing my best, uh, but like I I wrote a novel on a typewriter when I was 17. You know, I was like, but then it was just I did a summer program uh, between my junior and senior year of high school at uh southwestern missouri state uh, but they had a teacher from the art institute hugh merrill who was there and uh 
you know, he had studied with de Kooning at Yale and it just seemed so cool. And he just made me feel like I was actually good at it um, in a way that wasn't, you know, there are lots of, you have, I, I think a lot of people who are artists have friends who could draw well when they're growing up. And sometimes you're not the best, even the best at it. Um, and you're like, why did I end up doing this? And like Dustin didn't. Hugh really made me feel like, uh, like this was something I could do. So then I ended up applying and going to the the Art Institute. And uh, after that, it was full commitment. I, I I had to stop. You know, I stopped playing music for a little while. I stopped writing for. I, well, I actually I stopped writing for a year, and then I and then I double featured <laughs> and just wrote worse and worse poetry. But yeah, so it was. You know, I didn't really know, but. Uh, but at, when I did day jobs, like I worked at a, I was a steel worker uh, in the summer between my first and second year in college. And I like, was in the union and everything. It was just, so, it was, it was such an awful job. Everyone w- was constantly pointing out how I was not like them. Uh, Cause I would be like reading Dostoevsky on my break or something. <laughs> and so they, they all called me, they called me the professor by my back. Um, but it got back to me anyway. Uh, I was like, I just, I, uh, I'm like in this world and I don't quite, I don't fit in this world. So, um, yeah, arts, art school was the good, was a good spot for me. I feel like just that, that sentence, I was in this world, but didn't feel like I was part of that. Is that you and Holmes? <laughs> it's kind of, kind of it is, yeah. in, a, in a lot of ways. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's what, um, I think a lot of artists feel a little like outsiders, you know, you get some perspective from that. Um, so, you know, it's hard, but it's also, it can be kind of a gift to the, to the work. They, I'm thinking about you, the fact that you, I, I knew that you had mentioned you'd played cello before, but there's a certain color that comes with cello. Cello is not like an uplifting instrument. <laughs> um, you don't play like a cello, like solo. That's like sounding like, you know, it's like, it, there's a p- specific, uh, sort of not morose, but, um, again, back to mood. Um, how much do you, do you do the, you do the soundtracks for your own animations, right? I do. Yeah. If you would have picked up, you know, an electric guitar instead of a cello, do you think the tone would be different? Um, no, I think I was drawn to the cello because of I can the, imagine. Yeah, I think it was already in me. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was mostly cello. I mean, I started playing it in the fifth grade. I don't know why I, uh, picked that one. Um, I mean, they demonstrated the instruments and it just sounded the most beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. The violin as an instrument. Like if I were to personify it, um, you know, it kind of seems like an asshole. It's just too showy. <laughs> I've never uh, heard that before. <laughs> Violin it seems like, like cho- an asshole. <laughs> so what's a cello? Cello is just like a. Mel- it's kind of like the, it's, it's it's a little bit like the bass player, just kind of in the background. Yeah, kind thing. of. You're 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 supporting. Uh, yeah. You know, it's yeah. sonorous. It's uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I I don't have a casual way of of bringing this back in, but. I um I don't know if you mentioned it, but where did you learn to paint? Because you were you finished your residency when you were doing multiple different things, and then you said that you put down the oils, and then you just went to learn to paint, and that was going to be the thing that you focused on. And I'm wondering what that process was for you. And eventually, I wanted to try and get into some of those. And I know that we kind of touched on that earlier, but I really wanted to touch a little bit further into the impact and and the role that light plays with your actual technical paintings. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, first off, sorry, violinists out, out there. I'm, uh, I'm some, taking that. Some of my out. best friends are. Nope, taking that out. Friends. That's in there. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. The cello player talking shit to the violinist. That is perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, so I, you know, I, I spent about 18 months doing nothing but drawings and, and I would, they were, the drawings were like paintings. They were fully developed. They drew, I drew to the edge. I didn't leave white page particularly. And they were big. They, uh, 22 by 30 would be the, that was sort of the standard sheet size, um, would be the small work. And then I would do five and six foot drawings and it eventually culminated with a 17 foot multi panel drawing of uh uh that was based on an interview i did with my father it was the first interview piece i had done and there do you do you want to talk about that bit that 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 project that subject yeah it was because it was kind of the it was kind of it's like my origin story uh my almost non-origin story in a way yeah in in 1970 uh my on christmas night uh, no less. It was a- around midnight. My dad and his friends were coming home uh, 
across state lines in Kansas at the time, you could, the drinking age was 18. Uh, so he could, they could, uh, go to the bowling alley and drink. Um, and they were driving home. Uh, it's about midnight. They're passing this 1965 Buick Riviera that was kind of going really slow down this picture, just like a suburban street. So two, two lanes of traffic. My dad couldn't remember. He thinks maybe he, he flashed his lights at him, like, hurry up. You know, he's just inching along and then passed him. And then the car pulls up beside him at the next stop sign. So he's in opposing traffic, uh, but there's no, there's no cars out there. Um, and he thinks, okay, great. He wants to drag race. So let's do this. Cause he's in a Z 28, 1970 brand new cherry red Camaro. Um, so they, they peel out and they drive the, uh, remaining quarter mile at speed to my, uh, to his friend's house. But then the Riviera pulls in, uh, kind of, kind of, uh, pulls it up, you know, up close to his car. And he thinks, what does this guy want? So he goes over to the passenger side window, which rolls down. And he said he didn't see the the guy's face. He just saw a reflection of light off the knife blade as the man uh, stabbed him. Um, and my dad tried to knock the knife away. He has a big scar on his thumb. And he got stabbed in the heart, like, you know, center chest. But he didn't really understand what had happened. He was... Uh, going into shock and adrenaline was flooding his system. So he yells to his friends to get in the house and he runs to the house and he, he tears the screen door off, uh, you know, the suburban ranch style, ranch style home and throws it into the yard like Hulk. You know, he's just, he's so uh, adrenalized and he runs into the middle of the party that's going on and he's screaming and he collapses, but it's December. So he's wearing a thick Navy pea coat. So nobody knows what's gone, what's going on with him because they can't see the wound. But fortunately, his friend's older sister was an emergency room nurse, and she was able to uh, figure out the problem, administer first aid, call and wake up the cardiac surgeon, and and get an ambulance there to save his life. The drawing is the setting in the front of that house with the cars pulled into the driveway, and they're drawn at life size, um, but the characters are all gone. They're not, it's like a stage set that's been uh, vacated of the actors. And I made a sculpture of a cabinet speaker that he had at the time, stereo speaker, and an edited version of the interview plays from out that speaker. So as an audience member, you become a kind of uh, projector. Like you can, you can almost, I, I rely on you being able to see the events happening on that stage. Um, they, I think they would have been too hokey or inflammatory to, to actually draw the figures doing those things. So I kind of, you know, the audience becomes this, this middle person, this interstice that's connecting uh, these different moments. Yeah. It was, it was really a, a, almost like family myth. You know, he has large scars on his, all over his chest and he really, it changed the course of his whole life uh, because of this, this near death experience. How did this process change or develop or impact your relationship with him? You know, when you bring your family into a project like this, it, it's mm -hmm. such a, a new way of looking at an experience that you've shared. And also like how his relationship to your art changed. It's yeah, we, um, he isn't always the easiest person to communicate with. So I, a part of my thought with doing this piece was, well, we'll have to talk. <laughs> we're going to be in a room together and my sibling helped conduct the interview. So they were asking questions too. And, uh, my grandmother who had lived in the Ozarks, who was his mom had just died, uh, the year before. And so he just, he, I think he felt ready to, to communicate and participate in the process. He's always been a game to participate, but he, you won't necessarily get a lot of unpacking after the fact of what he thinks of it. He did come to see the show. I, I showed that drawing in New York, uh, in 2011, something like that. And he came out traveling, tra traveling from my parents to New York city is borderline traumatic, but they did it. And, uh, but the, the only thing he said was, Oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have those hubcaps on a 1965 <laughs> Riviera. <laughs> so that was the only feedback I got. Thanks for coming, Dad. <laughs> Specificity. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, he holds me to it. Um, but it's true. I was trying to make the drawing from his memory. So I didn't look up a lot of things. 
if he didn't tell me, I didn't look it up. So if he, if he said 1965 Buick Riviera, I would look up images of that and draw them and then try to take those drawings to make the, the big drawing. And I, there are parts of the interview that didn't get into the, that weren't in the final cut. They were like, did it, was there a basketball goal above the garage door? Can you remember how many garage doors were there? You know, where, what was the neighbor's house like? What kind of family car did they have? Most of what you're doing is from this, this way of trying to build these images then, you know, it's not, I, and I would have looked at all your work and thought initially that that would have been stage compositions and photographs but it's all just little bits that you've pulled together and kind of most of the time it has been that way. Yeah. Since, since, uh, since I kind of had that break from when I stopped oil painting and which for me, I, uh, I had studied, it wasn't taught to me in school. They were, I, I worked with kind of second generation ABEX, uh, guys, mostly guys, um, who, really wanted you to go and do this kind of soul searching. They weren't going to tell you how to mix linseed oil with, with turpentine to get the right, you know, whatever kind of medium. Um, so I, my response to that was to like read a lot of books and try to learn all those things. And the, the downside with that is I learned a bunch of techniques that had existed for three or 400 years. I had a really hard time ma making the, my paintings in oil paint in a way that was generated by that was by the actual process right there. You know, my way of using oil paint, um, it's just, you know, a deficiency of me that I, I could, I kind of like learned too much to, I couldn't set it aside, you know, stripping it back down to drawing. Then it, I, I hadn't really studied, you don't study pencil drawing necessarily. You're like drawing with charcoal in art school. So I felt like it was really just my, it was my thing. I could find a way to do it that, that was individual and was responding, solving the problem of right in front of me. Yeah. So the, part of what came with that is that I, I had that knowing more than I'm showing kind of thing. And I had to, I think you said the word build, you use the word build to describe the process. It's, it's a lot more like doing sculpture because you're, you're thinking, well, they're sitting, you know, the, the high school football players are sitting on this bench. How many supports does a bench like that need? You know, is it that you kind of remember suddenly high school, like the varnish on the wood, how slippery it was. It was like, okay, I need it to be slippery. What's a color that feels slick or like an application that does that. And you just kind of think your way through it. There's, there's a lot of, uh, it's a very orthographic, like you're thinking from three points of view at the same time. Well, it's forensic. I mean, the whole thing, it's like the, the entire, every aspect of this feels like it's just so so detailed and you could you'd be forgiven for not realizing the level of attention that gets put into every single element within that painting oh sure yeah i mean i, I don't want it to look like uh man he just look at this guy working so hard uh, <laughs> but yeah no it's it, i mean it's very kind of you to say that that it looks as though it you know that it's always that it's existed in the world but it's also part of that thing that you were talking about earlier this like this creation of mood and color like if you were just copying a photo you wouldn't be able to capture that sort of idea of what memory does for us and the atmosphere we create in our memories and that seems to be more important to you than just like let's make sure that i get the hubcaps right <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> um i mean part of it is i'm not a good photographer like when i look at i look at a lot of like art like photographers who are working professionally like Stacy Kranitz is a huge influence on me. Oh, she's great. Uh, yeah. You know, Curran Hadelberg is an amazing photographer. Um, I love the Mitch Epstein body of work, uh, family business for obvious reasons, you know, go, go find the big monograph. It's amazing. And, and when I look at their photos, they do some of what paintings, what I like about painting or what I strive for in my paintings. But when I take photos, they look flat and dead and it's, it just, it just feels like a past moment. It always seems like, oh, well, this is months ago. This is this is then, and I want the paintings to be present. So, and it's. I think I'm just. I'm. I'd, I hope I'm a better painter than I am a photographer, um, so that it has some of that that feeling of presence. Where I, I said I was going to bring this in, and you've actually given me a nice segue into this. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> where is is that interest in photography where you understand and you start to develop this real what feels like a cinematic understanding of light and its use within your composition my i think my interest in photography uh comes specifically from the fact that so many photographers are going into communities and spending time with people and mm -hmm. the work is reflecting that 
rather than painters. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, how often? I mean, Stacey Kranitz is like going into people's homes and living. Not, I mean, she for a while she was living in her car, and 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 so she could just park in a in an area where her subject was and see them every single day. And painter, we just don't do that as painters. Even when you go out in the world to paint, it's just there's too much kit to bring, and there's too, you know, it's just uh, it's it's too messy. You can't you can't just discreetly be, and it's slow too. But so for me, that's I I really respond to the the specificity of place and the connection to communities uh, that you know a lot of these photographers are taking in the durational aspect of it. For me, light comes. Uh, I know that the light is important because I uh, because of what it does when I when I see it in the drawings and and paintings. Initially, it started in the drawings. It was like, oh, the light, you know, the page isn't a piece of paper anymore. It's it's like light shining directly off that surface. The role it serves is I, because I do so many paintings of everyday activities, people doing work, people after work at leisure, people uh, you know in their homes. They're really banal kinds of subjects, uh, which is important to me. And then the light offers some sense of disruption in the everyday that I, I think I'm always seeking. Maybe I, I don't think I'm the only one. I, maybe it's because I was raised Catholic. It's like I want the uh, you know that I want some kind of rupture uh, draws attention to the significance of an everyday moment or offers some other significance and the the light that often happens in the paintings though comes from a really abstract place of construction um the shapes of geometry of both light and shadow they they come because of, there are gaps between my knowledge and where i need to go um so sometimes shapes are just scaffolding to help me understand a space where i don't have complete knowledge um and then they get built upon and it helps me see them um I, when the description is too direct then they then i then i um it it becomes that you know that past moment the flat painting it stops having that resonance and so the these these shapes are ways of creating rhyme and rhythm across a surface that ultimately hopefully leads to these moments of uh of surprise and rupture of mystery uh that that bring everything to life that's beautiful yeah um yeah i think that's there well i mean i guess i have, uh, I have, the la the I last have thing, one more i mean i have one more question written down but i don't know if i want to ask it <laughs> the, uh yeah, I mean, I had a couple more, but I feel like that was like kind of really beautiful. Doug, what was the last question you were going to ask? Or no, you no, that was a good. I feel like that was a good. That was a good finish. I am going to yeah. ask it though because okay. you are. I've, I've read that. I read that in in one of the interviews past uh, writing on you, uh, you were referred to as an American painter rather than an American who paints, and I wanted to ask you now that we're closing this. <laughs> what you feel about the American dream right now? Oh, oh Jesus God, Christ! <laughs> <laughs> to sum to summarize and close us all off, just quickly going to drop that in there. Yeah. See, I nearly didn't ask that, and you know why I didn't. I nearly didn't ask it. Yeah, yeah. You do remember the response where I said I don't want to create large. I don't feel confident in making large summary uh, uh, statements. So. You're you're really sticking it to me there. Um, I mean, I feel, I'm trying I'm trying really hard right now not to feel pessimistic um, because it's, I'm amen. a I'm a I'm a father and I I worry so much about the state of the not even the American dream like the just the planet and what <laughs> you know whether uh, what I just want to I just want my daughter to have a good life. I mean, that's like my I feel like that's everybody's answer, every parent's answer to who uh, to a question like that is like i just want it to be i want her to be able to live and to have the opportunities that we've had and i just really hope we haven't fucked it up so bad that that's not possible that's a very that's a very <laughs> diplomatic answer to the american dream you told the line very nicely very you kept good. it concise I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and please go to the Armory show in a month. <laughs> All right, and please do. Yeah, I really want to. Um, thank you for asking about the, the Work Center show. Because I, I just want to do everything I can uh, for them. Everybody should go by. The paintings are really affordable. 
I'll buy them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking the time and for inviting me. Thank you so much. That was Matt Bollinger in conversation with Evan Preco and myself for Radio Juxtapose. As always, we really hope you enjoyed that conversation. I think Matt's one of those artists that's your favourite painter's favourite painter. And a lot of what he talked about in this episode kind of falls under the bracket of demystifying the artist, ungatekeeping the practice. And I think he just approaches it all from a really sort of practical sense. And I think that really connects with the subject matters and themes that he's dealing with. Hopefully it's not too long till we're back with another episode, but till that moment comes, make sure you take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>